أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وإذ قال موسى لفتاه لا أبرح حتى أبلغ مجمع البحرين أو أمضي حقبا فلما بلغ مجمع بينهما نسيا حوتهما فاتخذ سبيله في البحر سربا فلما جاوزا قال لفتاه آتنا غدا أنا لقد لقينا من سفرنا هذا نصبا رب الشرح صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين وعلى آله وصحبه ومن استنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين اللهم اجعلنا منهم ومن الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصل بالحق وتواصل بالصبر أمين رب العالمين If I can get one of the guys to volunteer and turn all the fans off because it's going to make it hard to listen because of the sound we'll survive inshallah You can't hear me? Yeah, it's the fans, it's nothing else So we'll take a second, turn the fans off Yeah You can make up the words? Okay, is this better? Is this better? You still, it's still not better? Can you, can you sit here? Can you sit here? I'll get your chair over here. Yeah, I'm gonna try to, I know there's a lot of echo in the room, so I'm gonna try to be as clear as possible, inshallah. If you're, if you're sitting in a spot that's not very clear to listen, try to find another spot, inshallah, it should be okay. So first of all, I'd like to express how happy I am to have this opportunity to give us in this beautiful masjid. Um, this is part of an ongoing series. I've been working on a, um, a commentary on the Qur'an, a detailed commentary on the Qur'an, a study of it for myself and also whatever I get to study in depth, discuss with my colleagues in depth. I try to do lectures on them uh, in depth also. So um, Alhamdulillah, I've been able to finish about 48 surahs this way over the last... 10 or so years, 10, 11 years. And now we're up to Surat Al-Kahf. Uh, this is a project I started, I think the last time I was doing Surat Al-Kahf was 2016, 17. And then I stopped and I did work on other surahs and then I came back to the surah. So I'm continuing from where I left off. And uh, my intention, inshallah, once COVID kind of settles down a little bit, is to actually travel to different masajid around the world and continue the series from wherever I leave off. And so hopefully the entire work can continue. So I'd like to first ask for all of you to make dua for this project, uh, that it's something good that is left behind for our children. And inshallah, I also make dua for all of my colleagues that are helping me put this work together. Um, where I am at this point, where we are in the series, is the story of Musa alayhi salam and Khadir. It's, he's also called Khidr, and you know, South Asians, we like to call him Khizr. And we have multiple names. Khadr is the more common word name for him used in the, in the tafasir. His name is not mentioned in the Quran. And this is a story involving Musa alayhi salam. It's one of the most different, unique stories in the Quran. Even within the life of Musa alayhi salam, it doesn't compare to any other. And for many reasons, historical reasons, historicity reasons, which means how historically accurate is this? Where do we place this in his life? And for other reasons, it, it uh, represents a lot of complex study in uh, tafsir literature. So the Mufassirun have a lot of debates and a lot of discussion about the contents of this particular story. It's a very powerful, unique, and different story. Uh, and, it, and it has lots and lots of benefits. And so I'm actually up to ayah number 74 in my series. The surah, the, 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 the story actually starts uh, much earlier. So وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ is actually ayah number 60. And I, in my durus, I'm up to ayah number 74. But I don't want to start today from ayah number 74. I just want to give you an overview of what's happening in the story so far. And some things we can learn from it. There's lots we can learn from every single ayah. But some things that we can take away for ourselves that we can learn. So one way you can look at this particular story, uh, this very different story, is that the Qur'an has its way of teaching us, guiding us, about different parts of our life. And one part of everybody's life is learning and teaching. That's a part of every human being's life. I mean, even if you're not a teacher by profession, you're teaching your children one day. You're teaching your younger brother or sister. You're teaching somebody else who's new at the job, right? So even if you're not 
a teacher by a title, at the end of the day, you end up also becoming a teacher. And of course, as Muslims, we're supposed to be learners of this religion. And in some capacity, one way or the other, we're sharing and teaching somebody else something. Even if you're not a scholar, you're still teaching your younger brother something about Islam. Something about the Prophet ﷺ, right? So, the, and the Prophet ﷺ even told us about the Qur'an particularly, خَيْرُكُمْ مَنْ تَعَلَّمَ الْقُرْآنَ وَعَلَّمَهُ One of the most famous hadith about the Qur'an. The best of you are the ones who learn the Qur'an and what? Teach the Qur'an. So learning and teaching are at the core of our religion also. So much of our religion is learning and then also teaching, right? So this particular story is very telling because it's the Qur'an's way of describing wisdom or guidance from Allah uh, that a learner should learn and a teacher should learn. So because a, a, a student needs guidance on how to be the best student. And a teacher needs guidance on how to be the best teacher, right? So people go to school and get bachelor's, master's, PhD in education. And in education psychology, they study early, you know, uh, uh, you know, elementary school education, middle school education, teenage education, adult education, preschool education. There are, there are specializations in education, all of it designed to do one thing. How do you become the best teacher? How do you inculcate, te you know, knowledge over to another person, another human being, depending on their category, what age group they are, right? So there's lots that human beings have also learned about learning and teaching. But the thing to learn about the Qur'an, the thing we should know about Allah's book is Allah never teaches us something that we could have learned ourselves. If you could have figured it out yourself, Allah is not going to teach it to you. That's why there's no engineering in the Qur'an. There's no cardiology in the Qur'an. There's no architectural design in the Qur'an. Why not? Because human beings were given the capability by Allah to figure that out themselves. So even if somebody's getting a PhD in education and educational psychology, and they're learning a bunch of very beneficial things, those are things that are meaningful and valuable. That is something Allah gave the human being the capability to learn and to advance. But what Allah will teach us in His revelation is going to be unique. It's going to be adding to what human beings can learn, and then adding to that wisdom that can only have come from Allah. So what يُعَلِّمُكُمْ مَا لَمْ تَكُونُوا تَعْلَمُونَ He says in the Qur'an, He teaches you what you couldn't possibly know yourself. And Allah's way of teaching us these things, many times, is by way of telling a story. So instead of a chapter or a surah or a bunch of ayat dedicated to, here are, here's the guidance from Allah on how to be a good teacher. Here's the guidance from Allah on how to be a good student. Step one, step two, step three. Instruction one, instruction... It's not like that. We like bullet lists. We like the summary so we can prepare for our test. Qur'an doesn't speak in this way. Qur'an will tell us how to extract those lessons by way of telling us a story. And so the story begins with one of the most important teachers in the history of the world. It begins with Musa alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam, actually, if you know anything about the Jewish faith, and of course, he's, he's, a, he's a prophet of Allah, and he brought Islam, and the Torah was the book of Allah. And now the people who claim to have loyalty to that book consider themselves the Jews. Even they know that when we say Kitabullah, right? We say the book of Allah for the Quran, that's what we call it. They don't say Torah of Allah, they say Torah Moshe. They say Torah of the Torah of Moses. That's what they call it. Why? Because they consider him the teacher of, of, they don't say that he authored it, they consider him that much of a teacher. So the entire, the, the, the basis of that intellectual faith, because the Jewish faith has tremendous amounts of scholarship. It's an enormous, enormous amount of scholarship. If you've ever had a chance to sit with a rabbi, I have, have conversations with them, just to appreciate the kind of learning they have to do. They'll start learning at the age of 9 or 10, and they'll still be engrossed in 14, 15 hours of learning a day at the age of 45. Having done the, their, their seminaries, their institutes, then PhD on top of PhD, and they're still learning, studying and reading. This is how deeply engrossed they are in learning. Whether we agree with what they learn or not, right? So, and by the way, I had that conversation with that, the, 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 the friends I became with the rabbi happened because I gave a 10 minute talk about Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he just heard me talk about Ibrahim alayhi salam and he was sitting, in, I remember this like it was yesterday, he was sitting in the first row of this audience and he started crying. And this guy, these people study Ibrahim alayhi salam like it's their own father. You understand? They have this affinity to Abraham. 
they consider themselves the children of Abraham more than anything else. Right? Even though they call themselves the children of Israel, their actual affinity is to Ibrahim alayhi salam. And he was learning things about Ibrahim alayhi salam in 10 minutes from one or two ayahs of the Qur'an that his 30 years of learning had not given him. And he started crying. He said, I need to sit with you and talk about Abraham. I was like, okay, let's go find some kosher pizza and talk. Right? But anyway, that, that's besides the point. The point is, scholarship for them begins. If, if Jewish scholarship, which is a massive body of literature in the world, the seed of it is the Torah. And the teacher of that is Moses, Musa alayhi salam. And Musa alayhi salam is the teacher of all of the Israelites. But in this particular surah, we learn that among the Israelites, he did not consider just anybody worthy of being a personal student of his. You know, like, you know, in, our, in Muslim culture, sometimes you find, you know, that the shaykh takes a personal student in his tutelage, right? So he's got a class, a muhadara, a lecture program where hundreds of people are sitting there, but then he takes one student under his wing and he becomes his mentor, right? So Musa alayhi salam decides to take one among the Israelites and make him his mentee, someone he's gonna train himself and take on with him. And so Allah describes this student of his, this servant, and by the way, we know from hadith literature and from Torah also, that this person was Yusha ibn Nun alayhi salam. So he's a prophet also. But he will become a prophet later. Right now he's a young man. Allah says, وَإِذْ قَالَ مُوسَى لِفَتَاهُ When Musa alayhi salam said to his young man, to his young man. So Allah could have said, when Musa alayhi salam spoke to his servant, or his student, or his follower, right? But he used a very particular phrasing, فَتَاهُ, فتاهُ not, not لِخَادِمِهِ For his servant, no. Because fata has multiple meanings. First of all, it comes from futuwa, which means, you know, you guys know the word fatwa, right? I need a fatwa, right? So fatwa means what? A wise, mature decision. That's actually what fatwa means. And futuwa means decision-making ability. And a young man, when he's a, or a, a woman even, when they're able to make smart decisions, they become mature enough, they've reached the age of futuwa. That's when a young man is called a fata, and a young woman is called a fitya. That's the age that they reach. And then in poetry, now that you've reached the age where you have mature decisions, for the rest of your life, you can actually still be called fata. So in Arabic poetry, fata was also used for older people. So, you know, you're young at heart, I guess. But mature at heart is actually what it's referring to. So now, first thing we're learning, that the highest caliber teacher in the world, at the time, Musa alayhi salam, has chosen a young man as a student, and now, now we're learning maturity is not necessarily something that comes with old age, it can come at a young age too. And so you don't have to wait to be a certain age for you to be mature. You can be mature at 16, you can be mature at 18. In fact, I was having this really interesting conversation when I came back here with someone I consider an older brother. We had some time to sit and talk. And I remembered a program that I attended in New York when I was uh, 19 years old uh, in Queens. It was a masjid program, it was an i'tikaf, there was a bunch of guys, maybe 15, 16 of us, we stayed in the masjid for 10 days. And we were studying, we were studying seerah, we were studying Arabic, we were studying tafsir, all this stuff, right? And I was 19, there were a couple that were younger than me, there were a few that were a little bit older than me. And we're discussing everything from contemporary Islamic history, we're discussing seerah, we're discussing, you know, um, materialism, we're, just, we're discussing heavy stuff for eight, 10, 12 hours a day, right? And then we're, you know, we're goofing off too, we're guys. And, but we're, we're, we're in, in this environment. And then I was just talking to him like, where did that go? Like there were, there were people back then that were younger than myself, that I was like, man, this guy's sharp. And so serious about life. He's gonna do stuff with the, in the world. Like you, you saw this vision in people, in young people. You saw this maturity in them. And that seems like it was 100 years ago. It was 70 years ago, but still. It seems ages ago now that you have that kind of even attention span. Now we're at a time, forget discussing something for an hour, something intelligent. We can be talking about something for three minutes before you grab your phone and go. <laughs> and you're, you, you're trained, your mind is somewhere else. Futuwa is gone. So we have young, we have shabab, but we don't have fitya. You know, Surah Al-Kahf accolades and praises young people in the beginning. He didn't say, إِنَّهُمْ شَبَابٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ إِنَّهُمْ فِتْيَةٌ آمَنُوا بِرَبِّهِمْ So we're in need of that young youth with maturity. 
with youth with that strength of vision. That's a, it's a need of the ummah. It's, it's, it's the lifeblood really of the ummah, right? So, so he says, Allah says that he's his fata. Now, one of the things that I want, I don't want to just get stuck on this word because there's lots to, this is supposed to be an overview, not the first ayah. But, um, so what I want to tell you is, when a father has a young, bo- young man who gets old enough that he can take, start taking care of the business a little bit, he can start managing the responsibilities of the house, so dad can travel back home or travel abroad and everything is going to be taken care of because his son is there, you know. At that point, he won't just call him my son or my child. That's my young man. This is my man over here. This is, this is my young man. And that, that young man is a, is a term not just of authority, but it's a term of love, endearment, closeness. What we're learning already is you know, there's like you guys are sitting here in a lecture with me right now, right? So I, I many of you have heard me before. I help you go to sleep. That's fine, right? I, I, you listen to me and my voice is soothing to you and you, you go to sleep. That's fine. But uh, I don't know many of you personally at all, right? And my relationship with you is more actually your relationship with me than my relationship with you. It's more of a one-way street. But if I do, if a teacher does take on a, an individual student, that's different from Musa alayhi salam giving a khutbah to all of Bani Israel. That's different. He cares for them. He wishes well for them. But that's different. When he takes someone in, then he has more expectations from them, and he has more of a deeper connection with them, with that one stu- or two students or whoever they are. Right? In this case, it's one student. So we're in educational philosophy in the Qur'an, we're already learning that large classroom, classroom learning is very different from individual one-on-one learning. They're two very different kinds. They, they both have their place, but the other one, the individual one, isn't just about teaching a lesson. It's actually about developing a really deep connection. And the expectations are higher. You're not just gonna teach, you're gonna travel with that student. You're gonna give instructions to that student. You're gonna put responsibilities on that student. I can't give you instructions. You know, I don't know you. Right? You can pause me whenever you want and switch over to whatever game you're playing. Right? But that's different. But my, if I had a fata of my own, then he can't play no game whenever he wants. Hey, put that down. Right? That's different. The relationship is completely different. So if qala Musa li fatahu la abrahu hatta abluha majma'an bahraini aw amdiya hukuba. Now Musa alayhi salam is the teacher. He's been given instruction by Allah, you need to go to a place where the two seas meet. You have to journey to a place where two seas meet. He decided that none of the Israelite elders, none of the people that follow him in the entire ummah of Bani Israel is qualified to know about this journey or to go with him on this journey, but this young man is qualified. Sometimes a young man has qualities that the elders don't have. Sometimes people have more, one person may have, one young person who has no other background, you may, a teacher might see something in them that nobody else can see. They might see potential that nobody else sees. And people that know, for example, people that know business, right? When they hire somebody, they don't just hire somebody, they look at a resume, oh, you got a 4.0 GPA, you graduated at Harvard, you did this, you did this, okay, you got the job. They don't do that. They do a personality assessment. Look at the guy, so if you had this situation, what would you do? If you had that situation, okay, let's try you for a week. Right? And they look at the person, and this one guy is a Harvard graduate, the other guy is in high school, and the high school kid gets hired. Why? Because he's got potential. He's got a personality, he's got a work ethic, and that's better for the business, you understand? So this idea that if you have certain, if you have age behind you, family name behind you, degree behind you, that makes you more qualified. No, it doesn't. No, it doesn't. You could be a young man and be the most qualified. And so he, he takes him along and he says something to him. Now they're both going on a journey, they don't know how far it is. Allah didn't tell him this many miles and then take a right and then take a left, no, nothing. Just where the two seas meet. Just head out until you find the place where the two seas meet. Now Musa salam does not know where the two seas meet. He's just going and going. And his student is also going and going. And a student can get impatient, right? So Ustad, uh, when are we gonna stop? So how far are we? How much left? Where are we, uh, are, are we gonna take any breaks? Are, we, are you gonna tell us where we're going? There's gotta be questions and impatience. But Musa salam, it seems, before that question can even come up, Musa salam said something when the journey got a little long. Because it, it wasn't a 30 minute walk. It wasn't a two hour walk. They're walking it for days, weeks, maybe months. 
And then eventually Musa alayhi salam says, لا أبرحوا حتى أبلغ مجمع البحرين Listen, I'm not gonna stop journeying until I reach the place where two seas meet. Oh, or something else might happen. أمضي حقبة I'll end up spending multiple lifetimes. Why are you crawling behind me, young man? You're creeping me up. What you, what you trying to do behind me? What are you trying to do? You're trying to be, is that your friend? Is that what it was? You're trying to be, okay. Okay. You scared me. Were you going to make a, do the thing? Yeah. Okay. All right. What was I saying? Something about Islam? Amliya <laughs> Hukuba. I will not stop on this trip unless I end up, sp- even if I end up spending multiple lifetimes, I'll keep walking. I'll keep going. He didn't say, now this is important, he didn't say, we won't stop until we reach the two seas. Or we will spend multiple lifetimes. What did Musa alayhi salam say? I won't stop. I won't stop. Even though he's not alone, he's with a student. Few things here. First thing to note is, I don't know, you seem to start getting a little tired. I noticed that you've been doing a little more often. I noticed that your, your steps are getting a little harder on the ground. Right? You're stomping a little bit more. Uh, your, your back is bending a little bit, young man. And Musa alayhi salam is significantly older than him. And he's basically saying, listen, if you want to drop out of school right now, you have the option. I'm just letting you know, I'm going to keep going. But I'm not putting that on you. You can quit if you like. You can quit if you like. And he didn't say, hey, I think you're a quitter. Look at me, I'm an old man and I'm going and sharamni ayi to me, like you're not ashamed of yourself? You're gonna, you're gonna start you know, limping already? Seriously? He didn't do that. He simply said to him, and by the way, when you talk to someone, you use the word you. Hey, are you tired? Hey, do you want to take a break? You don't turn to someone and say, I won't stop until lifetimes go by. Because when you turn to someone, you don't start with I and talking about yourself. You don't have to say it. If it's your own thought about going on, then you don't have to say it. So why is he turning to his young student and saying something about himself? You understand? And the Qur'an's recording it too. Because Allah is teaching us wisdom about it, wisdom on being a good teacher. When you turn to a student who's being exhausted, when you have a student who's getting bored, when you have a student who's getting losing energy, the same enthusiasm they started with is starting to drift away. Then you can turn to them and say, you can quit whenever you want. But without saying you can quit and making them feel like they're a quitter, you can say, you know, we're both learners. We're both on a journey. You have taken me as a teacher, so you're following me. But Allah has offered me another teacher, so I'm a learner too. And I am so committed to learning that even if lifetimes go by, I will keep pursuing that journey. It's worth it to me. If, if I spent the next 80, hukum is considered 80 years. If I spent the next 80 years walking and not meeting that, not reaching that place, worth it. Ready for the next 80 years. And if those 80 years went by, another 80, another 80. Because hukuban is, is plural. Right? So it's 80 and then 80 and then 80 and then 80. What happens to students? Oh my God, when am I going to graduate? When is this over? Like even Hifth kids, right? They, they memorize the Quran, they do this. Like they, they look at the page thickness. Oh, who's left? When is it over? You just want it to be over. Because we're, we're always thinking about education in terms of meeting a, reaching a deadline. Finishing the curricula, graduating, moving on, getting the title. Nobody has a higher title at the time in the world than Musa alayhi salam when it comes to knowledge of deen. He's the recipient of Torah, he's the challenger of Fir'aun, he's the savior of, savior of the Israelites. He's the, he's the most mentioned in the Qur'an by the way, right? I say that over and over, I don't get tired of saying that. And he's saying, after all of that, when it comes to my learning, lifetimes are not enough. So what's the most important thing for a teacher? To demonstrate to his or her students that they are the biggest student of all. They're not the biggest teacher of all, they're the biggest student of all. And when the student sees that, the student says, man, he just puts me to shame. The least I could do is keep up. So at this age, he's saying, hukuba? I was thinking, can we take a break in 10 minutes? No, 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 I'm not letting, no, no way. My teacher's got that kind of energy. What am I, no, I'm not gonna let him, no, 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 no. I have the honor of being his student, I better show up. I better show up. 
So what does that do? The teacher doesn't become a source of shaming you. The teacher becomes a source of inspiring you. And the teacher, you don't look at the teacher and say, what an amazing teacher. You look at them and say, what an amazing student. It's a rewiring, isn't it? Because a lot of times in universities, in higher education, the teacher wants to impose on you how epic they are as a teacher, how much more they know. They've already, they've already reached the top of the mountain. Y'all are all at the bottom. See, I used y'all, I moved to Texas. So, you guys are all at the bottom. You guys need to reach to my level, right? But, as, but Musa alayhi salam demonstrating his commitment as a student. That's one really beautiful thing here. Then I'll, I'll, I'll skip a little bit because I just want to highlight a couple of quick lessons. So they eventually, فَلَمَّا بَلَغَا مَجْمَعَ بَيْنِهِمَا نَسِيَ حُوتَهُمَا وَاتَّخَذَ سَبِيلَهُ فِي الْبَحْرِ سَرَبًا Okay. So when, when they finally reached the place where the two seas meet, so they got there. They eventually got there, where they were supposed to be. And when they got there, you know sometimes when you're driving and you're supposed to take an exit, like exit 50 or whatever, and you miss it, and you get to exit 51, if it's on the New Jersey Turnpike, it's three hours later is the next exit. Right? Then you're like, oh, I gotta turn around. I went too far. Right? But the idea is if you missed it, then you come back around. But what did Allah do? They got to the exact place they were supposed to be, and Allah Azza wa Jal made them both tired. And He made the weather tough. So they had to go seek refuge in a, in a cave somewhere. In the exact area where they were supposed to be. And then when they got there, they fell asleep. So Allah made it so that you stopped exactly you, where you were supposed to stop. So here you have Musa alayhi salam wondering, if I'll ever get to the place where I'm supposed to get to, I have no other directions, but Allah said, go this way, find the two oceans meeting place. They're going, Allah sends a storm their way, they need to find shelter. The shelter is the exact place where they were supposed to be. Now in their mind, let's, let's look at it from their point of view. In their mind, both Musa alayhi salam and Yusha alayhi salam, do they think they've reached their destination? No. In fact, if anything, they might even be stressed out that they are now more delayed in their journey. So they think this is a detraction, this is a diversion, a side tour from the, the main mission. While from Allah's point of view, they are exactly where they are supposed to be. In fact, when they go on, as the story tells us, they had to come back exactly where they were. They were in the right spot, and Allah even put them to sleep in the right spot. He, they even slept in the right spot. Now here's the other interesting thing, like, uh, uh, this, is, this, this lesson is important. Sometimes we feel that Allah has put our, we had a plan for where we were headed, and Allah put something in our life, a storm in our life of sorts, and we gotta take a turn. And we end up somewhere we did not expect to be. And our original plan got delayed. The original plan got delayed. And we're like, oh my God, how am I gonna get there? This is, when is the storm gonna be over so I can get back on track? Not realizing that delay and that detraction and that detour you had to take was the best thing that ever happened to you. This is exactly where you were supposed to be. This was divinely ordained. Because you had sincere intentions to begin with, because I had sincere intentions to begin with, even the storms in our life are planned by Allah. So you seek shelter in the best possible place. That shelter, that cave might be better than any palace, any, any other uh, luxury. You understand? And so now we're learning to see for someone who genuinely wants to learn. Someone who genuinely wants to learn. You know, you guys, when you join university, your guidance counselor or whoever will tell you, you need to take these, these, these courses and these, these, these courses. And these. There's a layout, there's a plan. Earn this many credits, this many credits. There's a plan towards graduation. When you seek, when you turn towards Allah and say, Ya Allah, I want to learn your book. I want to learn your deen. And you genuinely take steps towards it. Then what will Allah do? Allah will point you in this direction, then point you in that direction. And you, these are unexpected directions. And you keep thinking, I need to have a full plan of action of what I'm going to do, and I need to have a five-year plan of how I'm going to execute it. And you know what? People who ask for a lot of planning, they just they keep asking for planning. Five years later, they're still asking for a five-year plan, and they didn't even start on the last five-year plan, right? Then what I'm then what I should what should I do? Then what should I do? When students come and ask me, Ustad, so I've done this, this is what should I do next? I say read this book. Then after that book, what should I read? No, after that, don't read. Come back and ask me when you're done reading. Never see those guys again. <laughs> Never see them again.
<laughs> Just give them one thing to do, that's it. But they would love to get a list of 20 things that they didn't do or will never do. <laughs> so the point is, here they got distracted, they got put aside. Now in hadith literature, we find something really amazing. Musa alayhi salam, what was his student's name? I forgot, let's see if you're good students. Yusha ibn Nun, very good. Yusha alayhi salam was told one thing. In this journey, Musa alayhi salam didn't say, you must prepare the food, you must look out for you know, animals on the road, you must do this, nothing. All he told him was, we have a fish with us. If this fish does something suspicious, tell me. That's all I ask you. You have to do nothing else. This is the only instruction you have. And you know what in the hadith, Yusha alayhi salam basically said to Musa alayhi salam? That's it? I mean, can you give me some more work? This is too easy. Right? So, how many instructions that Yusha have? One. Just tell me what, if something happens to the fish, just let me know. That's it. Okay. They go to sleep. Yusha wakes up before Musa alayhi salam. He sees the fish get out of, from death back to life. It goes, into the, it goes into the sand and heads into the beach. And it makes a, it like carves a path. It literally, literally trekked on the road and went into the sea. And he saw it. And the hadith literally describes it. He was trying to wake up Musa alayhi salam and he saw Musa alayhi salam sleeping. And he said, he's tired. I'll, I'll tell him when he wakes up. So he didn't tell him because he saw his teacher sleeping. And then when his teacher woke up a few hours later, he said, come on, come on, let's go, let's go, the storm's over. And he just packed up and left and he forgot, that, he forgot all about it. And so they're on the road and it's been a whole day or two. And, or a whole day goes by and Musa alayhi salam notices that the young man is getting tired. He's getting tired. And they don't have a lot of suitcases with them, they only have one basket with some food and the epic fish is in there, right? So Musa alayhi salam says, it's beautiful, he says, Atina ghada ana. Bring us our food. Bring us our food. You know in schools, teachers have a teacher's lounge, right? And the kids have the cafeteria where they fight each other to the death. There's two different places. Teachers don't sit with the students. The teachers have their microwave and their whatever, you know. Here you have the teacher with the student. And he didn't say, give me my food. What did he say? Give us our food. When you take a student close to you, then you make them feel like family. And you make them feel like, yes, I am superior to you in knowledge, but not when we come and sit and eat together. And also, what else did he say? لَقَدْ لَقِيْنَا مِنْ سَفَرِنَا هَذَا نَصَبًا We have met with some exhaustion in this journey of ours. He didn't say, bring us our food, I'm tired. He said, bring us our food, we are tired. You know what this means? Earlier Musa salam said, we will keep going for lifetimes. So who's got the endless energy between the two of them? Musa salam. We know he can walk all the way to Madian too. So he's, he's got some serious, you know, cardio, like <laughs> stamina. So he's going. He's now noticing that his young student is getting really tired. So instead of saying, fine, we'll stop, you're tired. Then he'll feel bad about himself. What does he say? Bring us our food. We are exhausted. Meaning you're not... And the, inside the student must be like, Oh, thank God. Oh, he's tired too. Okay, okay. I don't feel as bad. Musa is sensitive to the emotions of his student. So when he speaks to him, he speaks to him in a way that he recognizes, I see that you're getting tired. Let's, me too. Let's both take a break. Empathy from a teacher. You know what sometimes teachers do? Tired? When I was your age, I never became tired. When I, was your, when I was your age, I didn't eat for three days. You want to take lunch break? We didn't have lunch. <laughs> so, teachers put themselves as if they, they used to walk on water to get to school. And you should be grateful you have a bus. Or, you know, <laughs> they don't put themselves in the same place as the student. There's a sense of superiority from the teacher to the student. And here Musa salam is taking this young man and bringing him close and saying, this is our food, we're both tired. Okay, fine, our food, we're both tired. What's gonna happen next? He's gonna go reach for the basket. And then it, oh snap. Usually when we go get lunch, I move the fish and I get the sandwiches. But this time, there's nothing to move. Wait, where's the... Oh, oh, oh my 
God. How am I, how am I going to tell him? He gave me one job. One job. Don't forget about the fish. It's been two days, and I've done forgot about the fish. How in the world am I going to tell him? So now the student has terribly missed an assignment. The ultimate term paper has been missed, right? And not only has it been missed, it has caused damage to the teacher. The teacher had committed lifetimes to reach this place, and now they passed it. And it's not like there's mile markers. They're in the wilderness. So there's not even an exact way that they can find their way back necessarily. I love this. The student turns to the teacher and says, didn't you see when we turned towards the, the cave? Didn't you, you didn't see? You, you saw, right? You saw it too, right? Meaning, because if he saw it too, then the bl- Well, you did I thought you saw. I thought you saw it too. Wait, you didn't see that? What? That's crazy. <laughs> What's he trying to do? Lessen the blow. Diffuse the responsibility a little bit. And how does it start? Ara'ayta. Didn't you? When, when students mess up, what do they try to do? Wait, Professor, you said Thursday? What? You said? No, you said, you said next Thursday. You didn't say this Thursday. You meant this, this summer break? You didn't mean summer break 2024? Well, I just, I, I thought I heard you say that. Do students do this or no? Allah describes this young man as a student when he gets caught with disappointment, one of the first tendencies is def- you know, deflection of responsibility. That's captured inside Ara'ayta. Just in Ara'ayta. Didn't you see? He knows he was sleeping. The hadith tells us he saw his teacher sleeping. So we know he was sleeping, but he's still gonna say Ara'ayta. Then he says, he immediately realizes, no, 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 no. Uh-uh. I, 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 he caught himself. He caught himself in the middle of his speech. No, I'm putting it on him and I know that's a lie. That's just me trying to get out of an assignment because two students will do anything to get out of trouble. They'll start, get, they'll get sick all of a sudden. <laughs> I'm late, you know. I'm so sorry. My, my uncle died. Your uncle died eight years ago. Don't give him the date. It's still true though, right? My uncle died. <laughs> How many uncles you got? One for every class. Right? So you, the first thing is deflect the responsibility, some other circumstance. But well, what does he do then? إِذْ إِلَى When we had gone towards the boulder, then he said, I can't go through with it. I can't go through with making up an excuse. I can't do that. So there's a switch that happens from أَرَأَيْتَ to فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوتَ No, no, it was me. I, I, I forgot about the fish. That whole thing you told me to never forget? That was the only assignment I ever had? Yeah, I forgot. The best student chosen out of the Israelites by choice to be the personal singular student of Musa Islam among all of the Israelites, given only one exception on top of his maturity. He's mature, I told you this already. He's mature, he's trusted, and he's only given one task, and he messes up. What is the Qur'an teaching us about students? You could be the best student, you're not immune from messing up. And you don't have to mess up when the, ta- the, the task is very hard. You can also mess up when the task is very easy. And you know when that happens? When you underestimate the easy task. Guidance for a student. Don't underestimate the easy task. How many times has it been you take an exam and you thought that this is the easy chapters and those are the ones where you got hit. Those are the ones where you lost all your points because you underestimated the task. Quran guidance for students in life and in deen. What do we do? We underestimate. I want to study tafsir. Then I want to study fiqh. Then I want to study... Arabic is easy. Arabic can come later. You could just sound like you know it. Just, just, just put ayn in everything. You'll sound like impressive. You know, it is really easy. So it's, and what do you do? You, under, you underestimate the value of something. The importance of something. You mess up. But you know what? A phenomenal student has the courage to admit, I messed up. فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْحُوتِ But then also, وَمَا أَسْتَعْنِهُ إِلَّا شَيْطَانُ أَنَا But you know, after that, I did, I did forget it. But now that I think about it, it was nothing but shaitan that made me forget. We need to go back to that hadith. Why did I say, 
Why didn't he remind Musa right away? Why did he not? Anyone remember? Why did he not remind Musa right away? Didn't want to bother him, he was sleeping. And now he's looking back at that. That's what, I, I could have reminded you right away, but I thought you were sleeping. And then we got kind of moving and got distracted and it completely left my mind. And his analysis of that is what? Shaitan made me forget. Where is Shaitan in all of that? I thought you were sleeping. What are we learning about Shaitan? Shaitan doesn't just say, hey, do haram. That's, the, that's not the only Shaitan. Shaitan is also, and Shaitan is not there just to call you towards evil. But Shaitan, when it comes to your learning, is to distract you from the ultimate goal to secondary concerns. If he can take you away from your primary concern, which is good, and make your secondary concerns are also good. Caring for the rest of your teacher is a good thing. But when you can compromise your primary concern and become focused on your secondary concern, that is a trick of shaitan. He doesn't just want you to do evil, he wants you to be focused on the lesser good so you compromise the greater good. Right? That's his trick. And he caught it. He said, this is, this is how shaitan got me. It's pretty slick. Because the, the thing shaitan is focusing you on is actually not a bad thing. But it's just at the expense of something more important. You see? And this is the... the you know how they say the greater of two evils? One of the shaitan's tricks is to call you to the lesser of the two goods. Right? And that's an unknown, not, not as well known trick of the devil. But he recognizes that in himself. He says, next time I'll remember what, what to focus on. فَإِنِّي نَسِيتُ الْقُولِ وَمَا أَنْسَانِهُ إِلَّا شَيْطَانُ وَنْأَذْكُرَا وَاتَّخَذَ سَبِيلَهُ بِبَحْرِ عَجَبًا Now that I remember it, it was totally weird. This is, it woke up and it went and made a road in the... You know, it, it was really strange. Musa alayhi salam should be... If I'm the teacher and you are my student and we've been traveling for three months for this one spot and one instru- and you messed up and we kept going and then you remind me two days later, what should be my reaction? I knew I shouldn't have picked you. Are you serious? I can't even. Don't even look at me right now. Hold on, let me process. Don't show me your face. Let me process. And do we know Musa alayhi salam has a temper? And when he gets angry, what did he do with Harun alayhi salam, his own brother? He grabbed him by the, the head and the beard. Musa alayhi salam is the same Musa who saw some wrong, wrongdoing happening and he threw a punch. This is the same Musa alayhi salam. So he, he can get pretty intense. And this is one of those moments where a teacher, even if the teacher looks calm, there's steam coming out of his ears. Right? There's, there's, it's a really intense moment. And what does Musa salam say? He says, ma kunna nabri. That is what we have been searching. That is what we have been searching. What have we been pursuing? That's it. He listens to him. But no, you can imagine, you can read it out of anger too, but you can see that there's a briefness in the speech. And nabri is actually normally said. Nabri with a ya. But if you read the ayah, it's nabri. And grammatically, it's actually not norm to read nabri. It's normal to say nabri. But there is a, there's a, there's a taqseer of the word. The word is made shorter. As if to suggest, Musa alayhi salam realized that you made a mistake. He has two choices. Either he can lecture the student on what a failure he is right now. And how ashamed he should be. But Musa alayhi salam being the wise teacher that he is, he realized something. This student of mine started by thinking he could blame me. Ara'ayta. Then he realized himself that that's not okay. And he took full responsibility for himself. Then he analyzed how he made that mistake and how shaitan got him. So the lecture I was going to give him, he's already given it to himself. There's no reason for me to give him a lecture. He's already learned his lesson. I don't need to hammer him and shame him and remind him of what a loser he is and how could he mess up. I don't need, it's a, it's a, it's a lack of productivity. Our main, and me getting my frustrations out is actually taking time and energy away from our ultimate goal, which was to reach that place. So even the words, that is what we were looking for, have been made brief. The conversation is over, we need to get back. Let's stay on track. In other words, mistakes happen. If a person realizes they've made their mistake, they can, you can tell from the way they're describing their mistake that they get it. Then there's no reason to bury them in the reminder. And you know what? Now you're distracting. You're forgetting the real reason. They forgot it and they messed up. Now you're forgetting it because your goal is to get back. So let's just get back. Let's get back to work. 
This is the kind of teaching guidance and learning guidance you don't get in education degrees. You don't get it in education philosophy. This is divinely gifted. That every, and this, this will work in your family, this will work at work, this will work at school, this will work in you learning deen if you're teaching Qur'an to children, if you're teaching Islamic studies, whatever you're teaching, this is guidance for all teachers. So, ذَلِكَ مَا تَكُنَّا نَبْغِي فَرْتَدَّ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِ مَا قَصَصًا Then, so they, they both retraced their steps little by little, and they eventually made it back to where they had started. But the, the, the language of that ayah, فَرْتَدَّ عَلَىٰ آثَارِهِ مَا also really beautiful. They traced each other's steps. In other words, did we take a left here or right here? He doesn't remember. Musa doesn't remember. And Yusha says, it was this way. And sometimes Yusha is confused. Was it right or left? And Musa says, no, it was this way. In other words, they both needed each other's help to make their way back because it wasn't a paved road. What does that tell you? Even though the student has been a disappointment, the student has not been rejected or is off the books. You shut up now, I'm going to get us back. I don't want to hear another word from you. That's not what happens here. Step by step, both of them are together. So even after your student messes up, don't make them feel like they've been written off. They're no longer in your good books. And if you have messed up as a student, and you know your teacher is kind and, and is understanding, don't distance yourself and say, I shouldn't open my mouth, he hates me now. You shouldn't do that to yourself. You shouldn't make assumptions about how your teacher feels about you. You should be more present, more engaged. And you, you're the one who messed up, so you should be just as active in fixing it. And so this part of the story that I summarized for you today, is actually the part where Musa السلام, is the teacher, and Yusha ibn Nun is the student. And what's Allah gonna do? From here on in the rest of the story, it's gonna be Musa السلام, who's the student, and Allah has given him a new teacher. Right? So he's gonna flip the script from here on, and we're gonna get a completely different story from here on. So inshallah, maybe I'll summarize some of that for you guys tomorrow if you're gonna be able to make it. I'll stop it here. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Quran al Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa dhikr al Hakim. I'll take questions from you guys if you want to have any questions. How many more? I'm going to be here until Friday, inshallah. Friday. Jum Friday night. Maghrib to Asha. Yeah, inshallah. Then after that, I don't know what I'll do with my life. We'll figure it out. Maybe I'll do something else in New York, somewhere else. I don't know. Yeah. I can hear nothing. Wa alaikum salam. Wait, you guys are whispering? I can't hear. I mean, some of the, one of them happened, and at least one dialogue happens inside the, the palace between Musa and Firaun. Others may have happened outside. That's inside the palace. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because there are mala there too. Yeah. The generals are there. Yes. Not necessarily blame is a strong word. I wouldn't use the word blame. But starting off with making him the subject, as if to say, almost suggesting you saw that too, right? So, uh, we have to be careful with language around prophets, right? They're both prophets. But we still have to learn from what they said. So both have to go hand in hand. It is a pretty interesting shift though, isn't it? Yes. Yes, there is a reason, which shall be in episode 2 tomorrow. Tune in. Yes, inshallah. There is a reason why he's the teacher first and now the student. It's pretty profound. And I keep saying this is a very different story in the Qur'an because it really is. What he has to learn is unlike anything any prophet ever learns. So, it, it's, it's pretty remarkable that this is, this is in the Qur'an the way that it is. Especially for those of you that are students of philosophy, this might be really helpful. Because those of you that are going towards law school, 
probably have to deal with a lot of philosophy, right? So this, this stuff is really helpful. Last few, yes. Hold on. I'm really trying to hear. Okay, go ahead. I, I, in fact, the, the question uh, my sister raised is actually a really good one, a very good observation. I should have talked about it. I've talked about it in the detailed lectures, but I didn't mention it here. So they stopped where they were supposed to, and then they didn't realize it, and they went on. What do we learn from that? What do we, what do we learn from that? Sometimes you and I will be exactly where we're supposed to be and not see it. And all the signs are there. All the indications are there. And somehow, you and I are blind to it until afterwards. This is actually Allah's way of telling us no matter how much you and I know and learn and how qualified we are, when, when we become unaware or when Allah decides that all of our knowledge will be of no benefit. All, and look, they only have one focus, find this one place, there's nothing else. Musa, even some ulama in talking about these ayat said that Allah removed the responsibility of caring for the entire ummah of Bani Israel from the shoulders of Musa alayhi salam. He's only concerned about learning right now for ages and ages. He's not even saying, you know how he was with Allah in Allah's company for 40 days and he had to go back to the Israelites? He's saying, I will spend lifetimes learning. The Israelites are no longer a concern. Allah removed that responsibility from him when he's coming to learn in this way. And this singular focus and yet, they are exactly where they're supposed to be and they don't realize it. Why? Because our knowledge at the end of the day isn't enough. Until Allah's guidance comes and into our hearts, we won't even realize we're in the right place with all of the knowledge included. There's a humility before Allah in these ayat that, you know, that we shouldn't rely on ourselves alone. Like us knowing what to do and where to go and what to learn is only part of the equation. The kun from Allah that will become fayakun is the other part of the equation that we can never dismiss. And it's, it's remarkable that they ended up, they come, they come back exactly where they were. It's a pretty important, significant detail in this story. Yes, Yaman. Wouldn't Allah be the teacher of the situation? Good question. Wouldn't Allah be the teacher in this situation? Not Musa alayhi salam. Allah is eventually the, the teacher always. Look, so your, your, your preschool teacher taught you the alphabet, or your mom did. But your mom was taught by her mom, who was taught by her mom. And you keep going back, and all of a sudden you end up with Adam salam, who was taught by Allah Himself. So there's a chain reaction, isn't there? The same way Musa salam is teaching, like I'm giving a lecture to you guys right now, but I learned some things from someone, who learned some things from someone, who learned some things from someone. The only difference is, when I teach you, it's a mix of what I learned that is correct, and it's a mix of what I learned that is correct to the best of my knowledge. So it's not 100% not correct, it's only correct to the best of my knowledge. When prophets are teaching, they're not just teaching to the best of their knowledge, they're teaching something that's 100% correct, because it's coming directly from Allah, right? So that's how we think about prophets as teachers. That's a really phenomenal question. You're deep. Ah, so let's talk about that. That's a very famous hadith too. So Banu Israel asked him who is the most, in, most knowledgeable of people and Musa alayhi salam said, I am. And then Allah Azza wa Jal taught him that there's someone more knowledgeable than you. Let me tell you something about this hadith that we don't often discuss. We are followers of which final messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam? Muhammad Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi Can you imagine any sahabi ever coming to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam and saying, Ya Rasulullah, who is the most knowledgeable person? No sahabi would ever ask this question, why not? Tell me the obvious answer. Why would they never ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam, who is the most knowledgeable person? Who is among you? The Rasul of Allah. Who is taught by who? Allah Himself, you would have to be not a Sahabi to ask that question. 
you would have to be some level of words I don't want to use to ask that question to a prophet. Banu Israel asked Musa alayhi salam. What did they ask him? Man a'lamun nas? Who's the most knowledgeable of the people? What does that tell you about the... Forget the question. Let's think about the questioner. The person who's asking this question, what kind of mentality do they have? They are asking this question. You know what a troll is? You heard of a troll before? Yeah, Banu Israel has a lot of trolls. You understand that, right? They would tell, oh, make dua to Allah, we can't understand, cow, so confusing. Weren't they trolling him? Now they troll him with what? Who's the most knowledgeable person? Is this a sincere? I cannot imagine any scenario in which a prophet of Allah would be asked this question sincerely. I can't imagine it. And so when he's asked, by the way, as a teacher, I'm, I've been a teacher a long time. And you get all kinds of students. You get students in all shapes and sizes, all kinds of mentalities. And I know the students that are trolls. The students that are trolls. Like students that like to say, what's that? You sure about that? You sure about that? You sure about that? I know this guy. He's annoying. He's the, I sure, are you sure about that guy? And I'm, not, I'm gonna be nice to him the first few times, but now he's distracting from class. So for him, like for example, I have a student who I'm teaching Arabic to, right? I'm teaching some Nahu to him, some basic grammar to him, right? And he's learned like for three days. And he's like, Ustad, I think you're wrong about this, this, this. Like, no, actually, I'm not, and here's why. I'm open to being wrong. I can be wrong plenty, but I'm not because of this, this, this. But Ustad, I heard somewhere that this is wrong. Okay, what did you, where did you hear it? Okay, I'll explain it, fine. Two, three, four times, five times, ten times, Ustad, there's a difference of opinion. I'm like, where? And then, he, then the same, I've been teaching the student, pouring my heart out into him for a hundred hours. And a hundred hours later, he said, Ustad, what do you think is the, who do you think is the best Arabic teacher? <laughs> you know what I'm gonna say to him? For you? No one. You should learn Spanish. No, <laughs> or I'm gonna say, me. You happy? You happy? Now go. I'm not saying it out of arrogance, but I have a way of dealing with trolls. You understand? Musa alayhi salam may have been saying, because you know we give benefit of the doubt to people? I like to give benefit of the doubt most of all to prophets. I would never imagine he said this out of arrogance. I would imagine he said this to deal with someone obnoxious, to put them in their place. But when he said it, some other people are also hearing it. Some people that are not trolls, some people that are sincere. And as a leader, he has to say something that cannot be misunderstood by others. So even if he's, it's the right thing to say to one person, it's the wrong thing to hear for another 20 people. You understand? And for those 20 people, what will Allah send? Allah will send, you need to go learn. I'll give you an example of this from Rasulullah wasallam. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, my favorite example of this. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum anhu was a sahabi, he was blind. He was blind. Rasulullah is talking to a Qurayshi, a leader. He comes in, he's a, he's a family member of the Prophet He comes in, he interrupts the conversation, and he starts asking a question. Yeah? Who's being rude? Simple question, who is breaking manners? When you're already talking to someone, and somebody breaks the conversation. The Sahabi. He, he's blind, but he's not deaf. He hears there's a conversation going on. And by the way, those who are blind, are extra sensitive in their what? In their hearing. Then they're hearing. So he hears that the Prophet ﷺ is in the conversation and he interrupts multiple times. And Rasul ﷺ could have told him, can you wait a little bit? Let me finish this conversation. But Rasul ﷺ has such a huge heart that instead of correcting him, he simply bulged his forehead figuring out what should I do? How do I not hurt him? And I'll keep this conversation going. But he bulged his forehead. Now imagine somebody standing 20 feet away, 30 feet away, a Sahabi, he sees, he doesn't know the whole story, he just sees Rasul Sallallahu is bulging his forehead at the blind one, and he's talking to the rich one. Can he misunderstand the situation? Yeah. The ayat are coming, not for Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, because Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum radiallahu anhu is not offended. He cannot be offended, because he cannot see a frown. He can't see it. It's not like, abasa wa ta'awwaha. It's not he frowned and he said, <sighs> That's not what it says. He didn't, he didn't get hurt. He wasn't sad. He wasn't hurt. Rasul wasn't unkind to him. But someone might get the wrong impression. 
So prophets can get corrected السلام, because they're in such a delicate situation that when they're dealing with a person, somebody else might hear that and take it out of context. So they need to be given that, right? So I, I like to look at it more along those lines. Also, look at Rasul uh, Musa السلام, when he was told, you've been a teacher your whole life for the Israelites. You've spent a lifetime teaching. Now I want you to become what? A student. Look at his dedication to learning. He says, Ya Allah, give me lifetime on top of lifetime on top of lifetime, not just for learning. Even if I spent those lifetimes just to reach my teacher, I'm happy. Just to reach my teacher. Can you imagine the humility of Musa salam That for learning, for the purpose of learning, he would rather walk years and years and years and years of multiple lifetimes. I, so it's hard for me to, to read that in the Qur'an and then attribute arrogance to him of any kind. Or even thinking that he considers himself a'lamun nas. I would rather assume that he's putting somebody in their place and yet still Allah corrects him. So that would be my reading of it. Anyway, I'm going to stop the, the broadcast part of this now. And I'll hang out with you guys off camera. Barakallahu alaykum. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh.